Chapter 10 Wyoming Adventure The affair of Bill and Mose was a thing of the past. Their trapping rights were canceled, and they were facing a term in jail. However, they'd managed to cause trouble for Johnny in regard to the hound, for Johnny was not one to lie to the authorities, and therefore had to admit that the wild dog, which for a year had been practically a wolf, was his. In consequence, there was a considerable delay over rebuilding his cabin and renewing his commission as a ranger in game country. The most that he could do meanwhile was stay at the house of a friend in the outskirts of town and chafe over his enforced inactivity. Reddy had quickly become famous. People wanted to see him and hear all about him. His great size and the fine, strong proportions of his body aroused continual admiration among men who valued sledge dogs and dogs that worked in other ways for their masters in the rugged Northland. And Reddy, while still refusing to make friends with strangers, gradually lost all of his fear of man. He became accustomed to going in and out of houses, and even to being mauled by the children, who one and all idolized him. But he was not happy. Like Johnny, he too was chafing and longing to return to the mountains. There was a faraway look in his eyes when he lay dreaming in front of a fire, or sat outside in the snow looking in the direction of the Athabasca. He did not make friends with the town dogs. To him, they seemed like an alien race with whom he had nothing in common. Those that wanted to fight, he whipped quickly and thoroughly and those that were too cowardly to fight he disdained. Johnny worried about him and wondered how long the ties of affection and loyalty could hold him from returning to the wilds and again becoming a wolf, free to roam at will over the limitless timber ranges with the king. It was when the problem seemed at its worst that Johnny received a fat letter from Mr. Marshall, whom he'd met during the hunting season. The gentleman remembered Reddy. The letter, in fact, was an appeal to Johnny to bring the big hound to Marshall's ranch in Wyoming, where, during recent months, there had been heavy losses in cattle and horses from the depredations of a pair of mountain lions, which no ingenuity of man had been able to control. It's plain, wrote Mr. Marshall, that ordinary hounds are no match for these two clever killers. The best traps are useless against them, and rifles, as well as the beasts seem to bear a charmed life. I can think of nothing further except a trial of your extraordinary hound, whose unusual experience and strength may enable him to cope with these big cats whose range covers both mountains and forest in the roughest country to be found in the state. I hope you won't fail me in making this experiment. The invitation thrilled Johnny, who'd been born in Wyoming and always enjoyed visiting it, though his parents had been dead for several years. He did a lot of planning about making such a long trip with Reddy. Also, he spent a whole evening in trying to work out a scheme whereby the hound might be likely to succeed in treeing the cougars, or at least bringing them to bay where men could follow. The principal drawback was the possibility that they would injure Reddy, perhaps fatally, and in the fight that would develop, there was small likelihood that he would know enough about this new kind of enemy to stay out of reach of both Claw and Fang. There had not been any cougars as far north as Little Sheep Creek for as long as Johnny could remember. Reddy, during his pondering of this matter, was lying on the floor, in front of Johnny watching him his big, intelligent eyes seeming to never wink. Whenever Johnny looked at him, he wagged his tail, and when finally the ranger made up his mind to accept the invitation and rose to write a letter to Marshall, Reddy rose too and came forward whining and wagging his tail so hard that the tip almost beat at his sides. Johnny patted his head and smoothed the long ears. He realized for the first time that such sympathy and understanding had sprung up between him and the hound 
that his own excitement had communicated itself in some way to Reddy. Yes, boy, you're soon going hunting, he assured him. It's big hunting, too, such as you haven't ever seen, and somehow I know you'll do your part. On the following day, Johnny made arrangements to leave for the Marshall Ranch. There were not many things to do about this, but the authorities had to be informed, and an automobile purchased to transport Reddy, who would certainly not be jammed in a crate and shipped by train in the usual way. Then Reddy borrowed a horse, tied a few things on the back of the saddle, and rode to Max Castle to bid his best friend goodbye and to pick up two of the black and tans to be companions for Reddy. The hound accompanied him and raced ahead in spite of the snow, which was deep even along the railroad tracks where the snowplow had cleared much of it away. A loud, joyful baying greeted them at the castle. Mac came out and helped to take care of the horse's needs while listening to Johnny's story of the coming trip, his sharp little eyes twinkling all the time. It's the best luck anyone could possibly have, he said more than once. They talked far into the night, in front of the blazing mass of logs, about Bill and Moe's, about the trapping and the hunting, but most of all about Wyoming and Reddy, who was the cause of the stirring trip. Mac praised the black and tans. With their aid, he'd managed to shoot four coyotes he disliked so greatly. He'd seen the tracks of timber wolves, but no sign of the king. Picking the best two hounds for Reddy's companion was an easy matter, because Nell and her brother Bill were much more eager in their hunting than Bess, who was always content to just trail along behind them. All three were good-looking big animals, but appeared small when compared to Reddy. Mac hated to part with any of them. When those cats chase you out of Wyoming, he shouted after Johnny, Bring back my black and tans, or I'll wallop you. Okay, laughed the ranger, and a few cat's whiskers for luck. He turned around in the saddle from time to time to raise a hand toward Mac, who could be seen standing bareheaded in front of his lowly castle, until the heavy-limbed spruce trees intervened. Suddenly, he felt the urge to gallop all the way to town instead of slowly picking a safe path through the snow. Ahead was adventure and with him were the hounds, a fine a trio as could be found anywhere. When, toward the end of the week, Johnny was actually starting on the trip, it took him all the morning to get ready settled into the automobile. The hound was determined not to be led, or shoved, into what certainly looked like a particularly dangerous trap, and when at last Johnny, with the aid of a friend who owned the house, carried him blindfolded into the rear seat and shut the door, Reddy almost tore the car apart. Before the cushions and upholstery were entirely in shreds, they were glad to open the drawer and let him jump out. But seeing how easy and painless it was to escape from the trap, assured Reddy, who immediately lost all interest, as well as fear, and allowed himself to be put back in the car with the docile black and tans. It was a strange proceeding, and Johnny felt apprehensive during every day of the trip especially when all three hounds between became actively ill from jolting over the poorly cleared roads, and everyone had a miserable time. The stops for the night at various farms were happy interludes, except for the fights which were forced upon them by cross watchdogs. Reddy always got the upper hand in short order, and when they moved on left wiser dogs behind. At one farm, Two of the hired hands admired the red hound so greatly that they undertook to steal him. But they soon found that this was a different kind of dog than they'd ever seen in the past. The attempt was made in the middle of the night, when the black and tans were sleeping in the back of the car, and Reddy, according to his usual desire for freedom of action, was curled up on some burlap bags underneath it. The two men had opened the barn door and were tiptoeing to the car, in the almost total darkness, when Reddy, understanding perfectly well that they'd come for no good purpose, charged at them from under the car with one of his terrible roars. They had no time to even turn on flashlights. 
Both of them leapt for the door and tripped over the threshold, landing hard on the frozen ground outside, but not so hard as to prevent them from doing some remarkable running directly afterwards. And so it happened that in spite of delays on account of snowstorms and bad roads, Johnny and his pack safely reached Wyoming and the vicinity of the Marshall Ranch. It was below the Tetons in the foothill country, even wilder and more rugged than the ranger had expected. The broad road to the ranch itself was blocked by snowdrifts. So Johnny stopped for the night at a roadside hotel beside the swift little Wind River. Here, several ranchers gathered after dinner, and like all who saw the hounds, were greatly interested in the whole project. They spoke well of Mr. Marshall, and enlarged on the stories which Johnny had already heard of the mountain lions that, for some unexplained reason, had taken to eating the ranch's tame animals instead of the wild deer, sheep, and elk. One thing was certain. No trapper or hunter had as of yet killed either of the two marauders, in spite of so many attempts that the fame of the lions had spread far and wide. "'Have they tried hounds?' asked Johnny. "'You bet,' replied one of the younger men. "'I was with Jimmy Dillon when he took the trail, "'with eight good hounds and lost three of them. "'On account of so much snow in the mountains, "'we couldn't keep anywhere near the pack "'and never found out what happened to it. "'I guess the cats turned on the hounds when they couldn't dodge. "'Anyway, five came slinking into camp that night, "'pretty well scratched up with no fight left in them. After that, we just pulled out of the mountains. You think that the pair of lions stay together? According to the tracks, I'm sure of it, was the answer. The smaller one leads, that must be the female. The larger one follows in her tracks. You'll find it that way almost everywhere you run across their trail. I'll bet that big boy did the fighting when the hounds caught up. His tracks are quite some bigger than the biggest wolves, and I say he's all a nine feet long. Yeah, chimed in one of the listeners, he's a big one. Johnny was thrilled by all of this talk. He'd arranged that a couple of the men come with him the next day to help clear the roads with shovels. But soon after morning broke, Mr. Marshall and two of his cowboys arrived at the roadster after cutting through the drifts. They were very pleased to see Johnny, and almost immediately were ready to lead the way back to the ranch. When Marshall approached the hounds, Reddy recognized him at once, and stood, gravely wagging his tail while tolerating being patted. This won the rancher's heart completely. I wonder, he remarked, whether it's fair to start this grand hound after the lions. You heard about the recent hunt of Dylan's pack. His was made up of old-timers in the game, and yet it was very, very nearly cleaned up. Maybe we're taking too much of a chance with your ready, who just won't know what it's all about until maybe it's too late. Johnny had often thought of that, because he knew that mountain lions came rarely to the bleak mountains of Alberta. But he did not waver in his confidence in Reddy's intelligence, and the hard experience gained with the king. Don't worry yet, he suggested. He's learned about the lynx in the north. We'll try him and see. I feel more worried about the black and tans, although they'll just follow his lead. In that case, it's still a go, said Marshall. Not long afterward, the party was on its way to the ranch, on a single track road that wound around buttes and deep cuts made into the plateau by small creeks. Here and there were groups of gaunt cottonwood trees, but for the most part, low sagebrush was the principal growth that met their eyes cover that in the snow would scarcely hide a rabbit. At a big bend in the creek they came upon a herd of white-faced Hereford cattle resting low among the cottonwoods, and further upstream they passed a dozen heavy-coated horses, ranging in color from light gray to black, pawing the snow from the grass they wanted to eat. At some places they crossed bare patches of ground swept almost clean by the wind, Around these, Johnny, even from the moving car, 
could see tracks of jackrabbits, coyotes, and antelope. This was an interesting country. The first sign of the ranch building came after they'd topped a little rise and could look down on the broad, almost flat basin, with the creek in the middle where the high mountains set as a background. Here was a rectangular, single-story log house with several outbuildings and a fence of peeled wood. Bleached antlers of elk, moose, and deer were nailed over doorways, but there was no paint of any kind in sight. In a few minutes, the men were inside the log house, facing a wide fireplace full of blazing logs and being greeted by Marshall's soft-spoken pretty wife and his two children, one a tall, very blonde girl in her teens named Patricia, and the other a sturdy, freckled-faced boy named Bob, whom Johnny liked at once, and decided he was a year or two younger than the girl. "'Why don't you bring in the hounds?' Bob wanted to know first thing. We've got to see them. Johnny called from the porch. First came Reddy, walking gingerly around the rugs of antelope and bearskins. He looked very large and dignified as he stood in the middle of the room, with the black and tans timidly slinking behind him. Both children exclaimed with pleasure. Oh, he's wonderful. We've never had anything like him out here. He patted him and stroked his ears and almost forgot his brother and sister. Then the ranch boss, George Morton, and his wife came from another room and were introduced, after which they all sat down at a table that was pulled up in front of the fireplace and had a good lunch served by Mrs. Morton and Patricia, while the hounds ate from heaped plates set out on the porch. It was gay and jolly, and made everyone good friends. After that, the men sat before the fire, smoking and telling stories of hunting and ranching, while Bob romped with the hounds outside. Mr. Morton saved, until the last, the really thrilling news of the day. You'd scarcely think, he observed, that the lions would come anywhere near the house in snow time, but that's just what they did last night. I found their tracks not over a hundred yards up the creek. That's the nearest they've ever come, cried Mr. Marshall. Lucy, did you hear that? The lion's right at our backyard. It's a good thing we got the hounds. Shall we try them tomorrow? Why not now, right away, excitedly asked Bob, who'd just come in to get warm. Johnny smiled at him. He felt the same urge. Why not, he echoed. Just give them time to digest their meal, and I think they'll be all right. The excitement became general. Mr. Marshall agreed that it was a good idea. Snowshoes were pulled out of boxes, rifles brought from the closet, light but warm clothes were put on. Everyone except Mrs. Marshall intended to at least see the start of the hunt. They gathered on the porch and looked around for the hounds, but they were nowhere in sight. Johnny called and whistled. Mr. Marshall took a look around other buildings and Mr. Morton studied the tracks in the snow. It was Morton who found the first clue to their whereabouts, for behind the ranch house, where the wind was less brisk, he heard baying far up the creek. He shouted, and everyone joined him. "'Well, I'll be hanged!' he exclaimed. "'If they haven't found that old lion track that I saw this morning. "'Look, look, listen to that big-voiced one. "'Is that old Red?' No time to lose, interrupted Mr. Marshall. Let's go. Already he was striding toward the hounds, and the others followed helter-skelter over the snow. End of chapter 10